Okay, 1.5 inverse relations. So let's recall, a relation is a set of ordered pairs. Okay, a function is a relation, so only the one way, in which for every distinct x value, there is exactly one corresponding y value. Okay, so just recall the vertical line test. If it passes the vertical line test, then it's a function, f-u-n, actually f-u and then kind of like an exponent n thing. That's how you'll see this written in university, by the way, or f-u-n and then this actually means t-i-o-n. Okay, so if a function f is a set of ordered pairs x, y, then the inverse of x is the set of ordered pairs y, x. You see how we flip these? That's going to be key for both graphically and algebraically finding an inverse function, which is what we're going to do today. When the inverse function f is, is itself a function, then, the, then f is said to be a one-to-one -one function. So what is a one-to-one -one function? This is when no x and no y can repeat. So this is when f at x is a function and f inverse at x is a function. Okay, and while I write this out, I'm going to recall this notation right here. This is not an exponent negative one. This is the notation for inverse. Okay, so let's just talk about properties of inverse functions. So graphs of inverse functions are reflect reflections in the y equals x line. The mapping notation x, y, or y, x that's what we're going to be focusing on today when we're graphing, okay? All you do is you take the x and the y and you interchange them. You just flip them, okay? Uh, given a function f at x, the notation is, like I mentioned, f, it looks like an exponent negative 1, but it's not an exponent, so f inverse at x. And the domain of the function is equal to the reign of range of the inverse function, of course, because the x's become y's. So the domain of the original, so all the x's are now all the y's, and then the range, so all the y's, become the x's, becomes the domain. Okay, I should have connected this. Basically, because we had a vertical line test, if it passes, it's a function. Now, in order to be a one-to-one -one function, and again, you're going to hear about this a lot in university. Essentially, what happens is like we also have to pass like a horizontal line test. So if every horizontal line intersects the graph of the function of f in at most one point, then f is one-to-one. -one. Okay, finding the inverse graphically so for each of the following graphs so we have two graphs here we have this one it looks generally like without looking at the points and analyzing but this looks like a square root function and then this looks like a problem okay what we're going to do is we're going to draw the line y equals x so let's go ahead and do that we know that the y line y equals x goes through 1 1 2 2 3 3 4 4 five, five, and so on. So let's go ahead and graph that. And depending on how like your, your scale looks, like if it's, if it's wider or whatever, that line y equals x is going to look just a little bit more properly shifted, but that's okay. As long as it's accurate on your scale. Now what we're going to do is sketch the inverse function, and then we're going to determine if it's one-to-one. -one. So here's the thing. I'm going to actually locate, just for simplicity, I'm going to locate some x and y's on the original. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 2, negative 1. This is 1, comma 0. and 6 comma 1. Okay, now let's reverse those. Let's write those as y comma x. So I'm going to, instead of negative 3, negative 2, it's negative 2, negative 3. Instead of negative 1, negative 2, 
oh, sorry, negative 2, negative 1, it's negative 1, negative 2. 1, 0 becomes 0, 1, and 6, 1 becomes 1, 6. So let's go ahead and graph that. Negative 2, negative 3, negative 2, negative 3, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, 0, 1, 1, 6. Okay, so this is going to be f inverse at x. And then this we can call f at x. Now, the original graph, if we take a look at the x's and the y's, none of them repeat. Y and, like, the, let's go the x's don't repeat. So now, take a look at the y x's none of them repeat obviously because these are like the same numbers so this is definitely one to one okay so the one to one function we can also see that it passes the vertical line test for f at x and then it passes this horizontal line test for f inverse Okay, so for B, this looks like a quadratic that's moved down two units. Not sure if it's stretched or not. Just by like a look, I would have to actually analyze. But let's go ahead and write out the x comma y, and then we're going to flip them into y comma x. Okay, so let's locate a bunch of points. So negative 2, 2, negative 3, 9, 9. so negative 3, 9, negative 2, 2. Uh, let's go 0, negative 2. And then I'll do the reflection of those. So 2, comma 2. And then 3, comma 9. Okay. So I just looked at the graph, got a bunch of points. Now let's reverse them. Negative 3, 9 goes to 9, negative 3. Negative 2, 2 goes to 2, negative 2. 0, negative 2 goes to negative 2, comma 0. 2, 2, obviously those are doubled up. 3, 9, 9, 3. So let's go ahead and graph those. So 9, 9, negative 3 is off our graph, so I'm not going to graph that. 2, negative 2, negative 2, 0, 2, 2, and then 9, 3. 9, 3 would be somewhere here and here. Okay, but you don't have to graph that if it's off the, uh, the given graph. Okay, so this is f at x, and then this is f inverse at x. So, we can see that this is definitely, like, both of these are a reflection in the um, y equals x axis. And then, when we're taking a look at these, do any of these points duplicate? Usually what we're looking at for the original function are the x values. We'll know the x values are all unique. So this is this passes the vertical line test. All x values are unique. But then once it lies on its side, okay, we're kind of looking at the vertical line test again, or you know, from the original horizontal line test. Um, and this is definitely one-to-one. -one. So I'm no longer going to do like vertical horizontal line tests. Um, this one actually is vertical as well. But um, I'm actually just going to take a look here. Let's do green. I'm going to take a look here and be like, okay, so this nine and this nine repeat, right? And this two and this two repeat. So it's not one-to-one. -one. And you can either write one-to-one -one like this or one-to-one. Like that. Okay, I just want to make a note about the vertical versus horizontal line test. Those tests are to the original. Okay, so on this original vertical line test, it passes. Horizontal line test, it would fail. Okay, so it's not the horizontal line test on the new function or the inverse function. They're both on the original. Okay, and again, that's why it's not one-to-one.
okay, because that repeating y value. Sorry, just a correction. This is negative 3 comma 7 and then 7 comma negative 3 and then here as well. These are 7s, not 9s. Okay, so example 2, find the inverse of this either relation or function. I don't know yet. I haven't looked at it. And is this a one-to-one -one function? Okay, so we know f at x is going to have the points. And you can do like a uh, table of values like x, y if you want, or you can put them into, uh, like leave them in brackets. So 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, 4, 5, 1. So the inverse of this function will be basically y comma x. So because I wrote the inverse function here, I'm not going to write y comma x because I'm, I'm going to reverse them. But for the inverse function, it would be 2, 1. Okay, so instead of 1, 2, it's 2, 1. 2, 1, 1, 2. 3, 4, 4, 3. 5, 1, 1, 5. Okay, so taking a look at the, the original function, none of the x's repeat, so it is a function. Now let's take a look at the, at the inverse. Essentially, do any of the x's repeat or do any of the y's repeat? Yes, this x repeats, that one repeats, and I'm talking about the x in the inverse, otherwise known as the y in the original. So this is not a one-to-one -one function. Okay, now, finding the inverse algebraically, here are the steps. So, step one, what we have to do is we have to change the notation from f at x to y. And you know what, while I go through these steps, why don't we actually start on example three? Because we're given a function, and we have to determine the inverse and then sketch. Uh, sketch. So, step one, instead of writing with f at x, I'm going to write this as y equals, keep everything else the same. 2 square root of negative x plus 3 and then plus 1. So step 2, switch positions of the x and the y. Okay, and then just a hint, there can only be one x and one y. So let's go ahead and write the x here equals 2 square root negative y plus 3 and then plus 1. Okay, so we've already done those. Now what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange and isolate for our new y value. So let's bring this one over. So we have x minus 1 equals 2 square root of negative y plus 3. Now let's do, divide both sides by 2. So we have x minus 1 over 2 equals square root of negative y plus 3. Now the rule is what you do to the left hand side, you do to the right hand side. So this square root function, if we square it, the square root and the squared go away. They cancel out. I cannot just put a squared here. I have to square this entire side. Okay, what you do to the left hand side, you do to the right hand side. Okay, so now we have x minus 1 over 2 squared equals negative y plus 3. So divide both sides by negative 1 or multiply by negative 1. Let's do the multiply. Okay, so times negative 1 will cancel out that negative. Times negative 1, we'll just put the negative in front. And then just for space, I'm going to bring this positive 3 over and we're going to get negative x minus 1 over 2 squared minus 3. And that's our new y. So going back up here, now we're going to replace the y with our function notation. So we're going to go f inverse at x equals negative x minus 1 over 2 squared minus 3. Okay, so now we want to do step five. 
state any restrictions on the domain of the inverse function. Okay, here is my note, and this is like a little cheat sheet. So when going from a quadratic to a radical, when we say radical function, we mean like the square root function. What we have to do is we have to include the plus minus in front of the root sign. And I'm gonna to get to that in our next example. For this one, I'm gonna to touch on this. When going from the radical to a quadratic, which is what we just did, right? We have a radical function, and then we our inverse function is the quadratic. What happens is we have to include a restriction on the domain, and usually what we just do is like the right side of the vertex, okay? And this is how it's gonna look. So let me tell you this function here i'm actually going to rewrite this so i'm going to take out the one half okay and because the one half both the x minus the one is over the one half we can leave the x minus one but in this in this form this is actually in like our mapping notation form and we can identify the vertex so the vertex here is one comma negative three remember there is a built-in negative sign there so this is not negative one it is one the quote unquote vertex for the root function is negative three comma one boom mind blown take a look at that these are opposite right so our original function was a root function. It quote unquote started at negative three comma, oh, not negative one, negative three comma one, okay? And from 1.4, when we're taking a look at ske sketching functions, we know, and I can go to the side of my page and I, I can say, okay, the original is a root function. Now a stretch is not gonna do anything, and moving it around is not going to do anything. All we did is move it here. When we want to focus on what way our graph opens, we have to look at the reflections. So this negative sign on the K value, so it's like a negative K value, what's going to happen is we are going to have a reflection in the Y axis. So instead of opening this way, we are actually going to open this way. Okay. So that is our original function f at x. Now, let's take a look at the quadratic. Vertex 1, comma, negative 3. Okay, and the only thing that we have to really focus on here is, does it open up or down? So we can take a look at the... Um, at the reflection on like the a value. Okay, the A value is negative, so we're going to open down. Well, here's the issue. If we were to actually take this function and graph it, what ends up happening is we have two sides of the parabola. However, if we take a look at the original, we don't have two sides. We don't have this part of the... Uh, radical function that goes underneath which would make up the full quadratic so what we actually have to do is we have to put a restriction on the domain so that we do not include this part okay so how we would write a restriction is we would put a comma here and now it's getting a little sloppy because I have so much going on okay and I'm going to erase this vertex just so I have a bit more space and erase this. Okay. And you can put this beside. I just don't have room to put it beside. That's okay. So you want to put a comma here and then you want to say, which means kind of like a such that X is greater than or equal to what value? Well, the value of the vertex X, which is one. Okay, so just remember, x is greater than or equal to 1. So this goes straight with this little cheat note. We're talking about, because we're talking about the 
inverse. So what we have here, like this is the this is one, this is negative three, this is our vertex. So what we would do is we would say, okay, start at negative, or sorry, start at one and then go to the right, right? Because we're talking about X values and let's not regard anything that's less than one. All right, example four, given this function, so F at X equals negative three X minus X plus two squared plus one, we are going to determine the inverse and then sketch both functions. So if you're given a function, you have to determine the inverse algebraically. Like I don't want you to sit there and plot points and then reverse the coordinates. So um, I posted these five steps. So change the f at x notation to y equals negative three x plus two squared plus one. Then we're going to switch the positions of x and y, so the y becomes x and the x becomes y. Then we're going to isolate by rearranging. So bring the 1 over, we have x minus 1, and then just write equals negative 3, y plus 2 squared. Okay, divide both sides by negative 3. Now I'm going to put this in brackets. To really group it okay and then we have um, y plus 2 squared on this side so what you we do to the left hand side we do to the right hand side square root the entire side so that the square and the root cancel out okay so at this point I'm going to change the brackets here I'm going to rewrite this as negative one-third and then in the bracket, I'm going to write the x minus 1. Okay, because the 1 third is applied to the entire x minus 1, so bring that out. And then this plus 2, I'm going to bring it over, so it's minus 2, and then that's equals 2y. Okay, okay. So now replace the y with function notation. So I'm going to go f inverse of x equals the square root of negative one third x minus one minus two. Okay, and then in one second I'm going to do the the restriction, but not yet. Let me graph this. So the original has a vertex of negative two comma one. The A value is negative, so it opens down. So negative 2 comma 1, and then it opens down. Okay, so this is our original function, and I went ahead and drew the x equals y line, just so that we can get like a visual about whether or not we're doing this correctly. Okay, now, the inverse function has like that little fake, the, the vertex, with like, so we can call it the reference point of 1 comma negative 2. And boof, mind blown. These x and y's are obviously reversed here. So 1, let me do this in green, 1 comma negative 2. So we can see that those two points are equidistant away from the line x equals y. Now, the reflection that we're dealing with here, just on the side of my paper, usually we'd have a square root function opening to the right. We have a reflection in the y-axis, so now we're reflecting to the left and then just moving around. Okay, so this is where we moved around. Now, I'll put that down a little bit more. Now, this is f inverse of x. If we look at our inverse function, it is not enough. Because we're going from a quadratic to a root, and I will reference that on the previous note, we have to fill this in as well. We have to have the entire quadratic on its side, so we have to put in the plus, minus, the way we read it on the previous page. We have to have 
the positive square root and then also the negative square root which again this is just if you think about it a reflection in the um, a reflection in the x-axis because that plus or minus sign acts as a transformation on the a value and then we're done step five Example 5, given f at x equals negative 2 over x minus 1 plus 4, determine the inverse and sketch both functions. So we're going to flip y equals negative 2 over x minus 1 plus 4. Now we're going to switch the x and the y, x equals negative 2, y minus 1 plus 4. Okay, here is my recommendation before we try to isolate for y. Group y minus 1 as a binomial and I'll show you why okay so bring over the 4 it becomes x minus 4 equals negative 2 over y minus 1 now if we bracket the x minus 4 treat that as a binomial we can cross multiply the x minus 1 up or sorry y minus 1 Okay, do not expand these because you're going to get an xy term and that's going to be a disaster to get rid of. Instead, divide both sides by x minus 4. Okay, so all we did is essentially bring y minus 1 up, x minus 4 down, and we get y minus 1 equals negative 2 over x minus 4. Take this negative 1, now no longer treat it as a binomial, we can just graph it as plus 1, okay? So now we have the inverse function is negative 2 over x minus 4 plus 1. Okay, so a little tidbit on sketching. Right here, we have the restriction in the domain, x equals 1, that's our vertical asymptote. This movement up down is our horizontal asymptote. So what we would do first is graph our vertical asymptote, which is one, our horizontal asymptote, which is four, y equals four. And here's the thing, usually our function goes kitty corner opposite in this capacity. But right now, we have a reflection in the x-axis. So what's going to happen is we're going to go kitty corner here. So our graph's going to look something like this. Okay? And remember, we are graphing the inverse function. So what we want to do now is take a look at our new, um, our new equation. So our vertical asymptote this time is 4, x equals 4. Our horizontal asymptote this time is 1, y equals 1. But if you look at the x, y, and then if you remember switching it to y, x, the horizontal asymptote and the vertical asymptote also switch. So vertical asymptote is at 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So let's graph here. Horizontal asymptote at 1. So this is y equals 1, x equals 4, and there's still that reflection, so we are going to graph our inverse here. The only restriction that you have to really make on the domain is like x cannot equal 4, but that's from the vertical asymptote, it's not from anything else. So this is f at x, and then this is f inverse at x. Okay. 